Beautiful. Like, all right, let's do machine introspection. So um, sometimes your computers misbehave. Uh, sometimes something goes wrong. And very often, you kind of want to know why. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to look at a bunch of tools and let you figure out what went wrong, uh, what is currently going wrong, and how you can prevent it from going as wrong in the future. Um, so generally, whenever you want to do computer introspection, you're going to need privileges. So in general, the kernel will not let you look at arbitrary state. And so very often, you need either to be part of a particular group, uh, usually wheel, which is the, like, you can act as root group. Uh, there are other groups like power, audio, video, optical, disk, etc. that are used for various more special purposes. Um, probably just add yourself to wheel and it'll be fine. But if you're paranoid about security, you might want to add yourself only to the groups that you need. Um, in particular, we're going to be using the sudo command. Um, so the sudo command uh, is basically a prefix you can add to whatever command you want to run. And then it will run it as if you are the root user. So as if you have all privileges that are possible to have on the machine, mostly. Um, so for example, I can run date as myself, or I can run who is, I guess, who, who, uh, who am I? Uh, so it says I'm John, and then if I run sudo who am I, and it'll ask for my password, which I can then type, and now it'll sell, say that I root. Notice that it, it prompted me for my password. You can change that setting if you want to. So if you run the sudo, uh, sudo the sudo? <sighs> That's so annoying. Fine. No, 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 no. You, I think you must be set. So uh, vsudo lets you edit the sudoers file, um, and it will check that it is syntactically correct after you save it before applying it. This is very nice, so you don't accidentally lock yourself out of root. Um, notice here, there's a line that says root is allowed to run things as root. In addition, wheel, so people of the group wheel are allowed to run any command as any user, is what this line means. You can also disable the password check if you want. Uh, otherwise, it's going to prompt you for a password, and it does so again every so, every so often. But if I run sudo a couple of commands in a row, it'll sort of remember my password in some sense, remember my authorization from the first time I ran it. But after a while, it times out. Uh, whereas if I commented out this line instead of that one, then now it would no longer prompt for passwords at all when you run sudo, assuming you're in the right group. Uh, but I would like it to keep doing that. So let's just uh, quit that. Notice what I did here was sudo su. Uh, so su gives, basically lets you start a terminal as a different user, uh, and by default it's root. So sudo su, su means pretend that I'm root and that I'm starting a new terminal as myself. So it gives me a prompt that is me as root. And here I can run whatever I think I want immediately as root. Um, okay, so the first thing that you want to do when something goes wrong is you want to figure out what happened. And usually the way you do that is by looking at logs. Um, there are a lot of log files on your machine. Most of them are in var log, at least traditionally, that's where things were. Um, so var log, as you see, contains logs from all sorts of different things. Usually the file is indexed by name. There are a couple of uh, ones to be aware of. Um, in particular, xorg.log is handy for when x fails. Um, there are usually folders for specific subsystems like cups. Um, and normally if you're running a web server, for example, the logs will also be here. Um, there's also a kernel log. The kernel log used to be in var log and now is sort of encoded in stupid ways. Uh, so there's a command called dmessage, which gives you all the messages that the kernel has printed since boot. So if you run dmessage, it will show you all those messages um, since the last, last boot. And of course, from the data wrangling lecture, you'll remember that we can grep through these logs if you want from look for particular patterns. Um, finally, there's the system log. Um, and this is basically where everything is being logged nowadays. Um, some programs will also log elsewhere, like to var log, but in general, the system log is where you want to look. Um, most systems today, the, the system services are managed by systemd, which has its own journal daemon. Uh, the way you look at the journal for your program or for your system is by running the journal ctl command, which gives you the log since the last boot. Uh, gives you like a less, by default, so you can scroll around which is kind of nice, but you can also, of course, pipe and do data wrangling on that too. Um, there are a couple of things to be aware of with journal CTL. So first of all, if you run journal CTL without nothing, it gives you all the messages since the last boot. Uh, you can do dash u and then give it a unit like um, login d. Great, no entries for login d. Uh, system d login d. Great, because of course. Uh, so this gives me all the messages uh, made by systemd logging d since the beginning of time. 
which might not be what you want. You might want only the messages from this particular unit uh, since you started your machine. There's the dash B flag, which has only the last boot. Uh, you can also say only the previous to last boot or the third from last boot uh, or the first boot you know about. And so this flag you can use to try to debug what happened in previous reboots. Like let's say you upgraded your kernel, you tried rebooting, now there's a new log start and you want to check the previous boot log. You would use this flag. Um, General, General CTL also has this annoying property that if you try to pipe it through things sometimes, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, I think if I do dash B grep uh, intel, oh, it doesn't do it here. Okay, so sometimes General CTL, for various stupid reasons, decides to crop your log messages and just show the dot dot dot. So you sometimes want to give both uh, if it starts to do that. Um, there's also dash n100, which is, or whatever number you want, which is show only the last n lines. So this is similar to journal CTL, pipe through tail, n100. Those are basically the same. Um, all right, let's see that something is wrong and you want to figure out what is going on in your system. Um, the first thing to start with is the top command. So top shows you all the processes that are running on your machine, uh, how much CPU they're using, how much memory they're using, and a bunch of statistics about your system. Uh, most people don't really run top anymore, but it is nice to know that it exists. Instead, most people run htop, which is basically the same thing, but with a nicer interface, like it shows you how much load there is on each core, sort of more graphical representations of things. In addition, uh, you can do things like, here, you'll notice that it shows you all the threads of all the programs. You can press T to switch to a, a tree model, where it shows which things are some processes of what, which is really handy to figure out, like if there's some particular thing that's messing up, what started that program, which you can look at through this, or if that's all you really care about, uh, you can use PS tree, which shows you the same thing, sort of the tree of all processes and where they stem from. Uh, if you want to know the process IDs of them, you can do PS tree P and it will print the process IDs as well. So this is handy just for figuring out like what's going on and why is it running. Um, oh yeah, the tree mode in HTOP, which is press T to turn on and off. Um, sometimes if you want to know what those programs are doing, like I see a bunch of weird programs here and I have no idea what they're really doing, one thing you can do of course is look at their standard app if you have them open in terminal, but if they're running as a service in the background, you might actually want to check the logs. Um, and then it's useful to know about journal ctl f uh, which will follow the log. So it will print only the last few messages and then it will keep your terminal open as new things are logged, it will print those new log messages. Uh, the, sim the equivalent thing for D message is dash W, which stands for wait. So this is wait for more messages to be printed and just keep printing them as they come. Uh, and similarly, if there's a particular file like um, in var log, let's say that there's, let's say that I want to see new XOR log messages, tail has a dash F for follow flag, which will print the file and then watch that file for additional changes and if they come, then print them as they come. You can also do less plus capital yes. F. And you can also do yeah, less uh, plus F X org. Uh, I don't like less, but you can. It does the same thing. I don't like things taking over to my terminal. <laughs> it makes me sad. Um, right, the, the other tool that's really handy if you're looking more at resource usage is, is a tool called DSTAT, which I currently apparently don't Um, so DSTAT is a program that uh, monitors all sorts of different subsystems on your machine and then just prints out information about them. This can be things like network traffic, disk traffic, uh, the number of interrupts your CPU is handling, context switches, the number of processes, the CPU utilization. It has a bajillion flags for monitoring different things. So you can watch only certain CPUs, watch disk, watch paging, uh, swap space, all sorts of stuff. So, Look, I think there's uh, dash all, dstat dash a. No. But this is really handy for just like seeing a real time snapshot of what, how busy your computer is and what it's busy doing. Like if you're running some program and it seems like it's not making progress, open dstat and see if anything is going on. If all the numbers are zero, the program is probably stuck. Um, there are also more specialized tools for things like looking at disk space. Um, so for disk space, uh, DF is the most common utility. Uh, DF shows you for all the file systems you have on your machine, how much space is used, how much space is available, and where is it mounted. Uh, 
Um, by default, it prints the number of bytes, which is a little annoying. So if you do dash h, it will show you that in normal numbers. So in this case, you'll see that slash is actually this partition on this disk. Um, it's total size, use space, and available space. Uh, if you want to know what in a particular directory is taking up a lot of space, there's the du command. Um, so du stands for disk usage, but it does not show you disk usage. It shows you the disk usage of particular files. Uh, so for example, in my home directory, I could run du star, and it, actually, let's do this in Okay, there, there are two directories here. But let's say I wanted to figure out how large they were and which were more important. Um, I can run du start, and it will show you how large each of those directories is in terms of all of the files below it as well. Uh, dash h gives you a human readable symbol of it, and you can also do s to get a summary. Um, so if I do, uh, yeah, so the summary will not show you the things underneath you. It will just show you a summary of the arguments you uh, there's also a tool called Dust, which does all the same things, but you in a much nicer, uh, much nicer interface. Also written in Rust. Weird how that works. Um, if you're looking at network connections, uh, there's a tool called SS. So SS is fantastic for looking at what is connecting to what in your machine. Uh, by default, when you're on SS, it shows you all uh, all connections on your machine in all protocols that the network stack supports. So basically, all open software. Um, normally, you want to do something like uh, dash t. So dash t shows you all open TCP connections. You'll notice that I currently have no open TCP connections, which is right now like my laptop. Um, but if I did something like uh, download a Debian image, it will now show me that there's one TCP connection that's been established, queue size, which IP connected to which port, uh, where. And then when it goes away, now there's no longer a TCP I can also look for listening ports. So if I give a TL, it will show me basically all the server ports on my machine. Hopefully there should be none. Um, but if I start additional programs, like for example, if you're running Dropbox or something on your machine, uh, that's gonna start up a service. Or if I run uh, Netcat, uh, and see, do I really not have any Netcat? Very disappointing. It's a relatively new laptop, hence there's no stuff. Netcat is a really handy tool uh, for just piping data back and forth between machines. It's mostly used by hackers, uh, but it, it happens to sometimes actually be useful. Uh, dash L, localhost port 30, uh, 6000, great. And now there's, it'll, Right, so now it'll show me that there's one port listening on my machine. If I do dash P, it'll show me which program is doing that listening. If I put N, it'll sh not show me that this is the X11 port, but instead show me the actual port number. And so this is saying the, the program NC with this PID is currently listening on port 6000. So this is handy for just like figuring out what is running on your machine. Uh, and if you're like me, then you want the list to always be empty. Uh, if you start a browser, it would probably be listening on ports too. Um, okay. So that is networking. Um, so let's go briefly over configuration. Um, there are a lot of ways to configure a machine. We'll focus on two primary tools that you end up using all the time. Uh, the first one is when it comes to networking, uh, the IP command is just really handy. The IP command lets you configure pretty much everything that has to do with networking on your machine. Um, it comes installed with most modern distros. Um, the basic command you'll want to use is IP adder. So IP adder shows you all the interfaces you have, what IP addresses they're bound to. So in this case, uh, LO is the loopback interface. It's the interface you can use to talk to your own machine without going over the network. Um, things that start with E are us usually ethernet ports, uh, one way or another, so they're wired connections. And things that start with W are usually wired connections. So in this case, you'll see that my um, ethernet cable is state down, which means that it's not currently connected. Uh, whereas my wireless port is up, um, and it has the following IPv4 address, and also the following IPv6 address, if I should care about that. 
Um, you can also change all of these. So IP is actually a really powerful tool for changing the network settings. Uh, it's basically what is used under the hood to set up your network in the first place. Um, the IP command is notoriously hard to use. Uh, in general, you want to do things like IP health and then a command, and it will tell you in, basically it will tell you the grammar it uses to parse the commands, which is not the best form of documentation, um, but you can do things like IP, uh, I think you need to do like help adder set, help adder, uh, adder help. Great, so this is the, how the grammar it uses to parse IP adder. It's, it's awful, uh, and then add, and help comes last instead of first sometimes, I think it's like this. It's all sorts of stupid. Um, but if you look at the man pages, those are a little bit more helpful because they, if I remember correctly, they have some examples. Uh, not that the examples are particularly useful, but it gives you some flavor of what the command lets you do. It normally lets you do things like bring, bring interfaces up, down, change the IP addresses, uh, change broadcast addresses, those kind of things. In addition, the one thing you should know about is IP route. So IP route tells you um, if you're trying to, basically how your computer is gonna communicate with other machines. So if I send out a packet that's gonna go to anything on this subnet, so this specifies a range of IP addresses, then it says that uh, anything that I send to any of those IP addresses is gonna go to this IP address, and anything else, so default, anything else goes to this IP. So this is basically the way a network is configured, that any uh, host that's on the same like network as you, connected to like, the same switch or router, uh, is gonna be connected through uh, just directly. You can just send packets to them directly. Anything else, you have to go through basically your router. So in this case, my router is this IP address. So anything that is not going to something that's on the local network goes to the router and then it figures it out. Um, often, if your network is, uh, if, if you end up in a weird network situation, IP route will tell you what to do. Um, or how you might fix it. There's also uh, the ping tool, which is a really handy way for figuring out what's wrong. Usually the order of operations is first you try to ping a host. In this case, that worked. Um, so ping basically sends small packets to that server and sees whether, it was, whether you get the replies. Uh, here it says that I got a reply. If you don't get a reply, then try an IP address. Uh, if, you, if you do get a reply from your IP address, but not from a name, means your DNS resolution is working, so translating uh, domains into IP addresses is not working. Um, if you don't get an answer from either of these, it means that your local network isn't working, and then you might want to try to, so remember here, this is my router, uh, you might want to try to ping your router. In this case, that worked, so my connection to the router is operational, and so if something was broken, it would be broken on my local machine, or sorry, it would be broken on the router because I can talk to the router, but if I couldn't talk to an external IP, the issue is somewhere in between. This is a really nice way to sort of bisect your way down to where the problem lies. Uh, and if you have IP issues, uh, at severaresolve.conf is the thing that defines which um, name servers you're using, and so this is a handy file to like configure if you want some other settings than the default. Um, and finally, for system communication, um, if you have services that you want to run in the background, like um, cron, we talked about already, if you want to run some kind of web server or an SSH daemon or any kind of service you want to run in the background of your computer, those are managed by system D. Um, so system, system D is the system daemon and it manages your system. It, is, uh, it just keeps growing and what it encompasses, but the basic idea is that for every service on your machine, um, user, there is a service file. So for example, there's a service file for VBox web. And so the service files basically define a unit, which is a service. So we looked at those with journal CTL. You, know, you can do dash u and then a unit to limit log messages to only that. And it basically describes how you run that service and how you shut it down later. Uh, you can run, you control them through system CTL. System CTL status shows you all the services that are currently running and what IP addresses they have and which services depend on what. Um, you can use a system CTL stop, start, and restart, followed by a unit to stop a particular service, or restart a particular service. Um, if it produces errors, then just use journal CTL to figure out why. Um, you can also set services to either um, run at boot or not. So if you type enable under the name of the service, it will be started on boot. If 
you type disable in a circuit, it will no longer be started at boot. And you can even write your own systemd units. It's not terribly hard. Uh, and then they go in, et cetera, systemd system. They're pretty easy to write, but you need to look up what unit files are like. They're not terribly painful. Uh, it might be worthwhile to figure out how to write one if there's something you would like to run on boot. Um, Oh yeah, one last thing. If your boot feels slow, uh, system D analyze shows you how long your boot took. If you give it the blame option, it will tell you how long which thing took in starting up your machine. It's a handy command to uh, keep track of. Um, all right, I think that's all we, if we're gonna do program introspection as well, I think we're gonna leave it there. Actually, why don't we move program introspection to the next lecture? And if you have sure. more to say, you can keep going or we can end early. I have lots of other tools I can talk about. I don't have anything else I've scheduled. Just a quick question. Yeah, of course. What's the good one for Mac to return CT? There's a program yeah. called console on your machine. Console. Um, so if you just open up Spotify and search for console, you'll see it. And that's where you can see all the system logs. Yeah. Oh, it's like a program. It's probably a GUI. Yeah, it's a, it's a program. Yeah, and if you want the, there's like, I think instead of system CTL, I have a program like launch CTL, but like, uh, uh, stuff, but like, I have, there's a launch D. I'm, sh I'm sure it's Bumble. Uh, yeah, it's one way more. <laughs> yeah, if it, I, I have Bumble and uh, Mac is Bumble. It's not as bad as Windows. <laughs> well, Windows is actually getting better. For a journey to kill stuff. Uh, with PowerShell, you can do a lot of this with the shell. The syntax is pretty annoying. Yeah. Use the only use my I just want everything. Like, I don't want to have to open a program like ever. The only program I ever open is my browser. Everything else is terminal based. Um, all right. So so if I'm going to keep talking, that's fine. I have plenty of things I can talk about, but I have to install some programs first. So, mlocate is a package you can install on most systems. And what it basically does is it, uh, if you run update db, it will scan your entire file system and create a, an efficient search index. So I can do so, something like locate, I don't know, uh, 6858. And it will show me all the files on my machine that are related to 6858, that contain the string 6858. And of course, given uh, FCF, like we talked about before, I can use this to fuzzy search directly onto the list of all files in my system that contain 6858, and I can do so very efficiently. For example, I want all the Python files. I want all the exploit uh, Python files. Uh, and I want them in lab. And then I can do this, and now I have that app. It's a really handy, like locate is just really handy for finding things quickly because it doesn't actually have to, if you use find, for example, that has to walk your entire file system every time, whereas locate is just string search on some pre compiled index. Uh, the other pro program that's uh, useful to know about is DMI decode. Uh, so DMI decode, ooh, that's what we're talking about. Uh, DMI decode basically parses all of the firmware on your machine and tells you what different things are, like what hardware you're running and all the capabilities that they support. This is probably not useful unless you're doing like firmware upgrades or you're curious about what, what exact CPU model you're running. Uh, but it is kind of handy for those kind of things. Uh, like. Yeah, so for example here it says my CPU is uh, an i7, specifically it is this i7, uh, it has all of these features supported, what its clock speed is, uh, like cache slices and everything. There's also, um, why do I not have these programs before me? This is a program called LS Topo, um, which will show you the entire physical layout of your CPU, including all caches. This is pretty handy for um, doing performance debugging. So this is telling me that I have a single CPU package that contains four different cores, each one with two CPU, two logical cores. So this is hyper-threading. And it's showing me that I have uh, an L1 cache, of instruction cache of this size, L1 data cache of this size, L2 cache that is per core, and a shared L3 across all the cores. Um, and also the layout of my PCI bus. This is pretty handy. You can also get it for like, you can get it to print out um, text-only version. Uh, it also lets you, so it comes with uh, something called hwlock bind, 
which lets you run a program on only certain cores, or only certain CPUs, or only certain hyperthreads, uh, which is very handy if you're running benchmarking stuff. Um, you might have noticed that when I ran DMID code without sudo, it tells me something about slash sys permission denied. Um, so slash sys is something that's worth knowing about. Slash sys and slash proc are special uh, parts of your file system that are managed by the kernel. None of them are real files. They're just sort of meta information that the kernel exposes and sometimes lets you set properties that the kernel wouldn't otherwise let you set. So for example, if we go into sys, Class is generally the place you want to go if you don't know where you're going, because it shows you things by class as opposed to vendor. Um, so here, for example, Intel backlight. Um, here I can like cat out the max brightness of my screen background. Um, I can cat out the actual brightness, but also I can do things like echo 500 into actual brightness. Uh, I have to do that as sudo. And now the, really? Oh, sorry. Can't set actual. I have to set brightness, and now you can't see this, but my screen just did. Um, and so this is a way to basically cause the kernel to do things by changing parameters. There are lots of cool things you can do here, like change queuing behavior in the kernel, um, disable various safety features like ASLR. Uh, you can turn on additional safety features. Uh, you can rig your system entirely. So be careful about what you do here. But it is worthwhile to know about it. Um, slash proc contains information about all the processes that are running. So let's take some arbitrary process like this at the which is 6905. If I cd into that directory, um, so this is, this is slash proc slash the ID of a particular process. And if I ls, you see there are a bunch of different things to show me information, like I could cat cw. Or so if I ls la, this will show me that the current working directory of that process is home john. I cat command line, it shows me this is the command line this program was run with. Um, and so this is basically the files that htop and top parse to produce the information that they have. And you can do all sorts of things here, like mount the entire memory space of this process. But it's all very unsafe, don't do it. Um, it's also worth knowing about slash boot. So slash boot is the where all the files that are run when you boot your computer go. It's also usually where the configuration of your boot goes. Uh, so for me, yeah. Um, so for me, this is the configuration file. Here I can set basically which, which options I get when I boot my machine and what each of them do. Um, in boot, there are two primary files you need to know about. It's the VM Linux dash Linux file, which is basically the a boot image of Linux that's small enough to fit boot that then bootstraps the rest of your your Linux installation. And there's init ramfs, which is basically the same thing. It's not the same thing, they're two different stages, but for all intents and purposes, you can think of these two files as like uh, the boot image for Linux. So they are the things that set up all the hardware in your machine, and then when the hardware has been set up, these are the files that then start your actual Linux kernel that you install. Uh, these things matter if you're like running a custom kernel or something like that. It's just useful to know that these files exist. Um, ooh, I have IP tables installed. I have no idea. Um, IP tables is uh, apparently pretty much built in um, firewall that uses kernel rules to filter internet traffic. Um, I'm not going to go through all of how IP tables work because it, it is a bit of a pain. But let, it lets you set rules for packets that look a certain way, that are for a given port, that are from a given IP, from a given range, to a given range, by a given program and sort of basically manipulate them in however you might see fit. So for example, it lets you drop, the one normal thing to do with this is basically set up a firewall, uh, drop all packets that are for any port that's local to me, unless I specifically allow that port. Um, 
You can have it rewrite packets if you want. You can have it redirect packets. Um, if you set up a VPN, for example, it will often use either IP tables or IP routing or both to ensure that all of your packets go through the VPN and no packets can leave the VPN. Um, so it's a useful thing to know about, but hopefully not something you'll interact with too much uh, directly in person. Um, I think the last thing I would mention then, given that we got into VPNs, is um, WireGuard. So WireGuard, uh, sure, why not? Uh, WireGuard, that's why not. Uh, so WireGuard is basically a, an entirely new VPN implementation that is like implemented from scratch and works as a very small, opinionated piece of VPN software. It does not allow a lot of like configuration or anything. It just is supposed to just work and be secure and be fast. Uh, and in my experience, it has been. It's pretty easy to install, pretty easy to set up, um, and just works beautifully. Um, the way you start using this is uh, you run this command starts my VPN, and this stops the VPN. And that's all the commands you need. All the key handling is using like private public key pairs. Um, and so it's just so much nicer than having to deal with like MIT's VPN or basically any other VPN solution, which is often a pain to set up on Linux. Um, WireGuard just, just works. But you do have to set up the server yourself. Um, oh yeah, I think that's all I wanted to say about machine introspection. Although, I can probably say more unless you have more questions. Anything you like wonder about how you might figure out about your computer? There are also nice tools like, I think I have seen you guys do it on the board. Can I ask a funny question based on introspection? Yeah, of course. You can pass it through you. I'm not sure which, which, which shell you use. I use the shell. Okay, yeah. but yeah, I noticed that you use the Yeah, and then you have fish. I was just wondering if you all could like argue in front of us, because I would like to switch. I just use bash. Uh, Zish tries to be like bash. And that's a uh, drawback for a speech. Uh, the advantage is that it, it's, it's an advantage in the sense that more things that run under Bash run under Zish. Um, but it means that Zish doesn't have quite the same flexibility as Fish does to do things a different way. Um, whereas Fish is sort of saying, we're not going to care about compatibility with Bash. Uh, we're just going to do things in a more sane way, a more human friendly way. That said, um, you wouldn't really write scripts in Fish, although you can. It's more written for like humans writing commands or for loops or if statements or whatnot. Uh, whereas I think Siege is slightly nicer to write scripts for, in part because it's closer to Bash. That's cool. Is it bad for me to say, like, can I mentally think of it as like the I Python of Python? Fish um, being the I Python? Um, Thing is, like a lot of like pretty much, like I have like I use C sheets, but like I think the my config is pretty much identical to Fish. It's just like I, oh, I, maybe, yeah. It's, it's pretty much like like a lot of the things that like Fish introduced were copied into like modules that like nowadays you can have like even in Bash. Yeah. Like I run Fish without any plugins. Oh, nice. Uh, because I don't really need any. Um, whereas I don't. I think you probably wouldn't do that. So to me, this is kind of the, like at least like my main recommendation is to just like choose one and like look into like all the features that you can be using. Like don't don't stress too much on kind of what cell and just like figure out using things like syntax highlighting and like history substring search, like things that are like quality of life stuff. Like for so uh, I really like the the fish sort of statement of purpose, which is. Finally, a command line shell for the 90s. It was released in like 2000 and something, but it's like catching us up to the 90s, which I think is a good thing. Um, oh, it works on Mac OS? Did not know? Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's pretty neat. <laughs> Fish suggests commands as you type based on history and completions, just like a web browser. Watch out, Netscape Navigator 4.0. <laughs> Glorious VGA color. Except Z shell is like almost POSIX shell and fish is not ditching POSIX for trying to be slightly more human friendly. 
Well, one of the things, there might be an equivalent for this in Zisha, I'm not sure. Um, so Fish has this thing called, uh, so they basically have an expansion to aliases, where aliases are not just one command is equivalent to something else, but something expands to something else. Yeah, that's default thing. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, like glo I think they call it global analysis or something like that. Yeah. So, um, and it happens, it expands while I type. So, for example, you'll notice if I type ls and then space, it turns into exa. Because I've aliased ls to exa, um, but it will actually show me the true command. Like if I type print, which is an alias I have, it expands into the full command. And then lets me go back and edit arguments to that thing. Um, and I, I found that really useful that it actually shows you the command you're about to run. Yeah, that's awesome. As opposed to hide it behind other areas. Um, you can also do things like um, say that a command wraps another command. So um, AUR man, which is a, a package manager wrapper I use for Arch, um, it takes basically all the same arguments as Pacman plus a bunch of other ones. So I can tell Fish that uh, any argument that works on Pacman also works on AUR or on AUR man. Um, so in my Fish config, um, I have this thing. And this basically improves the auto-completion, so it understands that these commands are the same for anything that exists in them. You had a, do you have a question? Um, is there a reason why you still use Armin? And didn't they stop developing? Um, Armin is uh, no longer publicly developed, uh, but the maintainer is still using it. He was just sick and tired of all the criticism he got for it by people who didn't know what the AUR was or how to compile packages. Um, Arch is in this unfortunate position where you can find a package for pretty much everything, but it's in the AUR, mm -hmm. and people are writing tools to make it easy to install from the AUR, but part of the point of the AUR is those packages are not entirely safe to install, so you shouldn't trust the stuff that's there. Mm -hmm. um, and so he got a lot of flack from essentially new users who didn't know what was going on, saying like, your tool doesn't work. Um, but so it is still being updated, it's still being kept up to date so that it works when new releases come, um, but it, it's just not taking like public feature requests or anything. Um, it also has a bunch of nice features like um, if you do a system upgrade and there's been a posting to the Arch Linux news feed since last time you ran an update, it will show you that news update. Right?